Okay, everybody. Um, first of all, before we get this done, um, I'd like everybody to uh, give us give a toast to Mark Wainwright for all he's done for the chapter this year. Thank you, Mark, for everything you've done. And uh, everybody knows, I'm sure, Sean Tucker by now. Uh, he's our speaker for this evening, and uh, he's going to come up here and give us a presentation. Sean? Let's, let's toast the guy that got him to come. Toast Sean and back together. How long do I get? As long as you want. Yeah. <laughs> they probably like you to stay for. <laughs> <laughs> I, have to be at work. I have to be at work at nine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, believe it or not, it's um, seven minutes tonight, and it, it, when it, I'm not in the air show season. I love being the bed by nine. <laughs> uh, I eat dinner at five, man. I'm a real senior citizen. So <laughs> Donald, thanks for having me here. But, 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 but. First of all, I, I, I have to say how privileged I am to have had the opportunity to have the life I've got to lead in aviation and so honored to be an EAA member. Um, when, I, when I got into this business early on in, in my career, I was kind of on my own. And I made so many mistakes. I crashed my first airplane in 1979. Uh, because I was a fool and, and young and had to bail out of it and I lost a dream and when I got back into this business I joined the AA and I found mentors and uh, my mentors were world champions and they enabled me to fu fulfill my dreams because of their their mentorship and their and that's called EAA and that's what EAA is really all about and I remember the first time I flew, flew at Oshkosh Charlie Hiller world champion says that was 24 years ago he says, just do exactly what I say once just this one day please so I did and I've been back there for the last 24 years but my home my home is Reed Hill View Airport. I came here uh, in 1973. I, I was a private pilot, a horrible pilot. I was scared, uh, petrified of installing an airplane. I just had my license. I was dangerous. I was afraid of dying. <laughs> I'm serious. I was afraid of dying. When you have such a huge fear, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I heard about this aerobatic school and I knew you read aviation. And I met this little old lady named Amelia B. And with 55 hours of flying time, I told her how afraid I was, how petrified I was. She says, well, let's just go up and try some a few things in the top of it. And remember, everybody know who Amelia is here? Did she own a bunch of junk or what? <laughs> <laughs> and I loved every piece of, the, of her airplanes. It was just fabulous. And, and but, yeah, but she owned that business is because she had she was on a mission to um, teach people to fly. And I remember the first time we rolled upside down. I remember exactly where we were over Anderson Reservoir. The airplane didn't fall out of the sky. I fell in love with what I was so afraid of before. And I've dedicated my entire adult life to this art form called Air Show Fly. And uh, it's been, and now I've got 25,000 hours of flying time. And, and I love it more today than when I first began, when I first began, became hooked on it. So I'd just like to show you the first video. In fact, do you know how to do it? Up there, top left, Donald. Okay, we're going to. And this will just give you a top left, see the yellow thing? That's it, Donald. Okay. Uh, people say that I'm one of the greatest airshow pilots that ever lived. <laughs> My mind still a student of the art form. If I started thinking that I was the greatest air show pilot that ever lived, I'd be an immediate dead man walking.
passion for flight, number one, but also my reverence for the opportunity to share that magic with people. With, with, I fly in front of about six million people a year, all across North America, about 20 venues a year. Got an incredible team that support me in terms of a great maintenance staff. This airplane was built for me, to my specs. I've had this flying machine for uh, it's just finished our fourth season. We overhaul it every single year. That means we take the fabric off, we take the engine off, we take the propeller off, we inspect every well, we send the engine to the junkyard, I get a new motor, I give it to a hot rod guy who pumps up the motor from 260 horsepower to 400 horsepower. And we, the airplane weighs 1,200 pounds. <laughs> 400 horsepower, almost 1,500 pounds of thrust. It's huge control surfaces, and I fly it about 700 times a year to practice because the control surfaces are so large that you have to fly it with your fingers. The wings have to be your arms. It's all about nuance. You just can't throw it around. I see about 10 positive Gs going away from the earth, close to eight negative Gs. <laughs> tumbling forward. And it's tough on the body, it's tough on the airplane. The airplane, it takes four months to rebuild the airplane. I have a full-time staff who does that every year. And it takes me about three months to heal. Because it's physically very demanding. But when you get to live in the presence, and that's why we're all flyers. We're, 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 we're in the sky because it's who we are as human beings. We look at the world from a different perspective. And for me to fly in a low-level environment safely, acutely, and make decisions that are critical to my life, where I have to make instant decisions, I have to be one with my flying machine. And that's why I practice so much. During the season, it's three times a day. If I take a week off, it takes me 90 flights to get ready for the first air show after I've been off in the winter. 90 flights. It takes me 30 flights to quit being nauseous. I mean, it's tough, man. This stuff makes you sick to your stomach. I don't care who you are. This stuff just hurts, you know? And once I become G-tolerant and unnauseous, it's just fun. And when I get, and people really, you guys get it in terms of the front flips, the back flips, and the cool stuff I do, but the normal people in America that I fly for, it's just they see a red biplane in the sky and, and, I, and they resonate with my passion and my love. They connect with it. And when I land and I'm taxiing back, seeing these kids, this incredible amount of joy that these kids have, celebrating this notion that there's a human being in there, is humbling for me. And this is why I do have a high level of reverence. This is why I am so honored to be the chairman of the Young Eagles, and I'm actually, they called me at first the honorary chairman, and I told Jack Hilton, there's no honorary about me. You know, Harrison, was, who's a good friend of mine, Harrison Ford, was an honorary chairman, but he worked at Sully, Sullenberg, Latin on the Hudson, and Jeff. I'm working this. I'm working at every single venue just like these other volunteers. It, EA members, that's what's so great about us, we're volunteers to strive through our, our little ways to make the world a better place and to give a kid that first opportunity to fly, to let him see his neighborhood in a different perspective, and we get to see that through that kid's eyes, is I'm having such a blast. Number one, when I do it at a venue at every show, 
I get the media involved, I get the show involved, and they find me their best kid who wrote the best essay. And the media comes and they make the story because people are still so enamored with this concept of kids flying. And I walk up and there's eight media around this kid, this 14-year-old kid, and he wrote the best essay or he did the best in his community. And it's all about him. Yeah, it's all about him. And I just love being the conduit to connect them because other kids read this and they 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 get it. And so we're really spreading the word um, across the country at every venue where I take these kids flying. But what else I get to do is take that chapters. And you know, I owe you guys one. You guys pick out who which volunteer coordinator or pilot you want me to take flying. We'll go down to King City. But I take the volunteer. That chapter is best volunteer, the one they decided to go fly with me, and we do aerobatics. And man, I, I just, these volunteers are all the same. They got love in their hearts. They care about what flying means, and, and I've gotten so much out of it, and I, I really do feel honored to be the chairman of the Young Eats. And, and, and it's, you know, it's, there's a, there's a, a saying that, um, wealthy, successful man said. He said, you know, it doesn't matter how rich you are, it doesn't matter how famous you are, it doesn't matter any of that. If you're not giving back, you're not relevant. And you know, the EAA members give back to this community, and to me, that's, that's not only relevant, it's righteous. So I decided in my community to take it one step farther. I got work for you. You got to quit taking your picture. <laughs> <laughs> Can you do this? You're going to have to put it right to this one. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. And we just finished our first batch of seven at risk, which was kids on probation. Right there. Just hit it. Perfect. This is Selena Southland. Oh. Human beings by challenging them to solo flight of an airplane. And uh, it's going to be a very, very fun project. How do I get it? How do you do it? Learning to fly is a little scary. you got to use math, you got to use physics, uh, you got to fix your head, you got to fix your nerves. What this really is, is an outreach program to challenge kids, to enable them to push their boundaries. We got all sorts of flying machines today for you. Um, I'd like you guys, if you like it, fly one time and then get into another airplane and try that airplane out if you want to. I'd like to take you guys on a couple of flights. You guys all for that? Okay, come on. I gave them a little basic knowledge of what airplanes do, we showed them how the ailerons work, and then elevator work. And we want to share our love, our knowledge, our skills, and give them those skills to help them define themselves, or redefine themselves. Right, have you ever flown an airplane before? No, <laughs> sir. Have you flown in an airplane? No. no. So what are you doing today? I'm oh, just going to try it out. So you're going to fly this, all these airplanes today, you're going to fly and actually hold it. All these kids are on probation. All these kids aren't on probation anymore. And some will fly. And some will finish all the way through. All these kids were in gangs. None of these kids are in gangs anymore. All of these kids got their high school diploma. Three of them are going to college. Nobody ever has because it's so redefining. That was cool. That was cool. You remember you said you were nervous? And guess what? You conquered a fear. You know? <laughs> That's what it's all about, man. <laughs> when did you get on nervous? He's a mechanic at the airport in Salinas now. He's still wearing a fly. So we're going to go down to something and then... Do you want to be in the pools? Yeah. No. Very good. No. Are you? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
We got an airplane 152. We're funding our next patch. I start them out as young eagles, so I, I have all that access. You know, I have the, the sporties and the whole thing. And, and what, what I learned, not one of them is solo jet, and, and we kind of, and that's not their fault. It's because this was a brand new program, and I was using all the great volunteers, and then I found out that volunteers also have a job. <laughs> <laughs> and, then they, and, the, and the guys that were teaching them were, had, had corporate jobs, so the next batch, we're, we were hiring a full-time flight instructor, and we're gonna get them through in 10 weeks. But what I saw, what I saw in, in these kids is how they, the self-esteem they got from this. And it was because it was a long process. I took them to Dayton, Ohio, a friend of mine, funded me to take them to Dayton, Ohio. They met the Blue Angels. They got to see the world. None of them been in an airliner. Or in fact, at the restaurant in Dayton, Ohio, one of the kids said, what's an appetizer? Oh. Never even knew what an appetizer, but the self-esteem they got through this metaphor of flight, then I realized, then I realized what I did for them. And one of the kids there, and this is the first day I met him when you first saw me walk up to him, scared me to death. He gave me the gang bangers. I, that if I kept steering him down, I was afraid he was going to stab me. I mean, it, this is how serious these kids are. Within three hours of that hangar, they all became kids again instead of Tom. They all had renounced their gangs. They led, they became the leaders in this probation program that I'm involved in called Silver Stars. 180 kids in the thing. And we, we specifically chose those kids from different gangs in the Salinas community. My community is 72% Hispanic, and they shoot each other. We got the highest kid on kid shooting in America. And, and because of the rival gangs and the whole thing, and these, so we specifically chose kids from each gangs who are in trouble. And all the other kids are in trouble, but pretty soon they were starting to collaborate and work together because we were partnered with NASA, they have a SEMA facility there at Hardell College that's right next to the airport. They gave me 22 computers and they gave me the lab anytime I want to use it. And these kids are all of a sudden going to college. Now three of them are going to college at Hard Now. It's just, it's just great stories. And it's all about the payback that I, because every, all the gifts I've been given from people who are in the EAA. And it has nothing to do with me at all. I just get to be the conduit and, and generous people making it happen. I, we got time for some more talking. So, I'm going to give you, who's seen the propeller blow off my airplane? Okay, so <laughs> this is, this, I call this, uh, luck comes to the one most prepared, and there's no atheist in a disabled airplane. <laughs> I don't think many pilots are atheists anyway, because of what we get to see. But this is pretty, so in fact, this little girl that I took flying was my niece's best friend. This is, um, about 16 or 17 years ago, using one of my flight school airplanes. And my niece, had, as it was after Easter, my niece asked, she was a, this little girl was going to college at UC Santa Barbara, asked, will you, Uncle Sean, will you take her flying? And she, she was just a delightful young lady. And I took her flying. We're doing an inverted flat spin. And the prop comes off, okay? And then it wasn't fun anymore. <laughs> she became a missionary. <laughs> it's a true story. Calling me back. Oh, uh, by the way, I forgot to introduce my wife. Uh, 37 years or 8 years? No. Calling Stan. That's my wife calling. Actually, actually, she was going to San Jose State, and I was hitch. I was going to uh, college in Santa Cruz, and I was hitchhiking over here. Didn't have a car, and I'd end up if I stay in too late. I'd end up and spend the night at her house, and we just were friends. <laughs> And somehow we became more, more than friends. She was in nursing school at San Jose State, and we became more than friends. And all of a sudden, we got married, and we're still hanging out. <laughs> and she puts out, she puts up with me for a long time. <laughs> Donald, can you do this? Sure. Let me show you which one. We're getting really lucky here, right there. Okay, you got to listen to the dialogue because this is what makes. Yeah, it right. Work. You got to listen to the dialogue. Just after here, and we'll go. <laughs> 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 
there's a saying, you fly it as far under the wreck as possible. And, that, and I didn't know if I was wrecking, but I knew I couldn't jump out of the airplane because at 3,500 feet, it's 30 seconds before you hit the ground. She's, she trusted her life with me. We're going to do this as far into the wreck as possible. And if you normally have that attitude, never give up, be prepared, you're going to make it. You might break the airplane, but I didn't care about the airplane. I was telling her to tighten up her shoulder harness because you should have seen that oak tree coming up at the end of that Propester airstrip, man. It was coming up fast, but it was wet. <laughs> I go, yeah. And that big laugh at the end was my laugh, and I'm no longer Mr. Cool. I'm just glad I'm alive. <laughs> go ahead. What's your question? Did you ever find the propeller? Oh, yeah, this is the funniest thing. You're in a pretty flat spin. I'm just, everything's all good. And it goes, oh. And that thing just flew like it still was connected to something. It's a wing. It flew, 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 and then it went. And it auto-rotated, and it just bent. Bent the blade, slanted in a, it was a wet field, and it landed on one of the furrowed beds. And it bent the blades, so the nose cone was still perfect. Um, <laughs> So I took it to the propeller shop saying, can you fix it? They said, yeah, easy, it's a metal top. <laughs> and, and then they turned it over. I didn't take the crankshaft off of the, the boat part of the crankshaft. So what, what happened here? Oh, I broke off my airplane. You mean, from what altitude? <laughs> That's 3,500 feet. It goes, absolutely not. We're not fixing that. <laughs> then I call the insurance company. I say, hey, man. In this, I had a good relationship with this lady. She insured my show planes and my school planes. I said, Sue, I had this thing happen, you know, I just lunched the motor, which is 50 grand, and I got it. Maybe at that time it was 35 grand, and I lunched the prop, and that time it was probably 12 grand, and I don't have the dough. Colleen's going to kill me. What am I going to do? And she said, well, did you do any damage to the airplane? I said, oh, I tore up the cowling, and the prop nicked the wing when it came off. But not that. She said, how much? I said, about 5,000. Well, you know, 10% deductible in motion, blah, blah, blah. I'll send you a check for... 4,500. I said, no, I need a new motor. She says, we don't insure that. That's a mechanical. So I said, if you would, if I would have crashed it and destroyed it, you would have written me a check. For, oh, yeah, that's why we do things around here. <laughs> so, but what I did is have a video. So I sent one video to the engine guy and one video to the propeller manufacturer. And both companies were very eager to give me an engine and propeller. <laughs> <laughs> So we've been friends ever since. <laughs> you know, but this whole journey that I'm on is um, one that I still love so much. Is um, You know, and I'm getting pretty close to retiring as a solo performer, not because I want to, it's because physically it's getting harder and harder to heal every year it's in, in, from the G's. And so I'm probably going to transition from solo performer to starting another team. And I'm getting, got, getting kind of excited because I'm flying a T6 now. I have a four-ship aerobatic team. But for me, flying's always been a dream. I still love flying more now than I did when I first started because I understand how precious it is to get up there in the sky. I love the challenge. I love the, the idea of pushing my own personal boundaries. I envy these young guys here just going on their journey and they have a and if you listen to your friends, you listen to your mentors, you're, you're going to succeed. And you might succeed the other way, but it's going to be a lot easier when pe let people open the door for you and, and you know it's safe to go through and be reverent on the opportunity and you're going to have a heck of a career because there's nothing like making a living doing something you love. You know, and it's nothing like pushing boundaries because every adventure you go through you're changed. You're not the same person coming out of that adventure. You're better. There's nothing like sharing it and paying it back, either. I, you know, it's. I believe you push it. You should always push your boundaries and push it big time far, and then it goes into magic. So thanks for having me here. I'm honored to be a member. Now pick out who's going to go fly with me. You guys have to figure that out. And, uh, we're not going to do the graveyard spin. <laughs> We're not going to use a metal two-bladed prop. <laughs> that combination of crankshaft, propeller combination, the gyroscopics were huge to do an inverted flat spin. In those days, you know, 15, 16 years ago, we didn't know the huge gyroscopic loads we were putting on that airplane just doing it with full power, keeping that nose up. You, you think about it, then you understand why it broke. It's, it's just 
You can't have a two-plated prop with all that that gyroscopic <laughs> loads on it. We do now a three-bladed prop that you, and we've never had a failure. I mean, in the industry, it doesn't have a, a crankshaft propellers coming off anymore because we're all using composite, which is either wood or, or true composites, and we all the loads are equally or it surrounds the crankshaft. And there's not unequal loads, and we never have those failures anyway. So we won't. Do that, and we'll go buy an extra 300 or pits for a T6, whatever you want, and come down to Salinas. And is there any questions? Yes, sir. So uh, you normally fly the biplane. Uh -huh. And I'm just wondering why, instead of the extra. Oh, well, first of all, my biplane rocks. And I, <laughs> okay, but, but, but let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. The monoplanes dominate the competition. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, but they don't rock. Flying a monoplane is like dancing with a prima ballerina. <laughs> Big, long lines, elegant, graceful maneuvers. I'm like dancing with a biker girl. Uh, we're <laughs> down and dirty, we're just rock and roll, man. And, and truly, monoplanes rock the competition because they're looking at lines and angles. Always rock the competition. And I wanted a monoplane, but I couldn't afford one. I won the national championships in the advanced category in 88, but the Pitts S2S paid 32 grand for it. That's what I went on the road with, and that's what I started becoming successful at. I was, and by the time I could afford any airplane I want, I already established the brand. And people expected Shondi Tucker, thank goodness. Number one, my son named me Shondi Tucker. I used to be just Sean Tucker. But he'd go, that's my dad, Shondi Tucker. And then people <laughs> resonated with it. And also they expected a biplane. And so what I did with this biplane has made it better than those monoplanes. And how I did is I use some of their technologies. You know, I have a flying tail. I use, I have carbon fibers where I want it. I can go, there's some, some monoplanes that can still outrun me, but not many. Full throttle, I'm 240 miles an hour. You know, that's a lot of speed. And I can get through the corner so much quicker because I got monoplanes that are 30 foot wingspan. I'm 19. I can round those corners and I can keep it in the box right there. That's why. But I own two extra 300. Oh, I know so I know <laughs> but four biplanes, baby. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Do you, use, do you uh, wear a, a suit on there? So the, no. Um, the, well, first of all, to use a pneumatic suit, yeah. RJs are really quick. Yeah. I mean, we're. And so you can normally get through them. We don't do lots of sustain. I do 9.7 on my poles, but they're quick. Um, you, can, you can have a civilian G suit, but you weigh, it weighs 50 pounds. Yeah. And what if you have an emergency? And remember, I got to fly with my fingers, yeah. and I got to be, if I had a 50 pound, you know, I'm bailed out airplanes. I mean, you want to see a bailout video? Yeah. yeah. But it's just the aftermath. Okay, one more, and this is it. <laughs> <laughs> this is, again, there's no atheist in a disabled airplane. This had nothing to do, well, it had a lot to do with luck, but it wasn't skill that got me on the ground. Right there. Sean, what's the tightest fix you were ever in an airplane? Oh, you'll see this one. This, I found this one here. Yeah. Oh. A stunt show became a rescue mission. That's right, the pilot in Louisiana never thought that he would have to leave his plane until a mechanical problem forced him to jump. Brent Forbes has more on this story. So Brent Forbes residents got a private air show of a different kind from a world-renowned stunt pilot around 10.30 Tuesday morning. We saw the plane up and circling and then we saw it actually when it, he bailed out and when the plane went out. The Challenger aerobatic biplane came down in a cotton field on Michael Simpson's I Hope Ranch in Lake End. I saw the dust when the, when the plane hit. In a few minutes I saw it parachute. The world famous stunt pilot Sean Tucker flew out of the Red River Parish Airport to practice his routine for a weekend air show. Tucker's spokesperson, Carl Coppin, says Tucker noticed a mechanical failure shortly after takeoff, just a short time before his 8,500-foot jump. It took about 15 minutes to assess the problem, realized that it would probably be unsafe to land it, so during that time we, we found a good, a good landing area, a, a wide open field, and he elected to wait till the field just got not empty and jumped out of the airplane and parachuted down. 
is it an everyday thing for Stockpot? It's not an everyday thing, but it's something you train for repeatedly. <laughs> now all that's left are the bits and pieces. They don't, you know, salvage what's that? Get it out of this guy's flat field and, uh, not, you can put it back together, you know? In Red River County, for CBS News. Sean Tucker was on his way to the Sun and Fun Air Show in Lakeland, Florida this weekend. His spokesperson says Tucker will not fly in the show, but he can teach other pilots a lesson about getting out mid-air and surviving. Yes, he... This I can. <laughs> I can teach you guys don't crash in Cachado, Louisiana. It's a whole different part of the world, baby. <laughs> so, I'm... I was on, en route to Sun and Fun. I had just flown at, uh, the first show of the season in Riverside, California. Completely overhauled the airplane. All new parts, all new hardware, everything. Uh, practice it on my way across the country because I got to practice every day, three times a day, to do it right. So I practiced on my way. I was practicing at a friend's aerobatic box in Louisiana. And I had just completed a seven and a half G pull, getting ready to go to the vertical. 225 miles an hour, 10 feet off the ground, going up, and a rod end attached to my torque tube, which is attached to my elevator, failed. And for the first moment, I thought I was dead. And it's interesting how you become sensory overloaded to and this. I mean, it was like I blacked out almost because I was had so much stuff and I said I'm dead. And a second later, or maybe it's a nanosecond later. I'm alive. I, the stick broke, it went up, and then it went this way, and I'm heading back to the ground, but I grabbed my trim bar, and it went ooh, ooh. And I got above 700 feet, and I said, I'm gonna live. And I messed with it. And it almost stalled, and get it done, stall. It almost stalled, and get it done, stall. Then I'd get it going, because I didn't want to lose this airplane. I had 11 years in this girl. She started the season, I got prepaid uh, half my sponsorship, and I had all these people working for me. I, I know I'm gonna get fired. I wanna save this airplane and salvage it. And I get close, and I only have a, a limited amount of fuel. You know, I, was pra I normally practice with an air show practice of 14 gallons. This happened at within three figures in the practice I had. <coughs> I didn't have a full power going on. But uh, I couldn't, I couldn't get it close. I'd almost get it close to where I think I could land it with the stick, but it was just, the lead lag was so much, I couldn't get the oscillations to work. And so I did, elected to bail it out. So we put it in a spot, got the roads closed, had plenty of time to do all this. Would have been a fast emergency and left the airplane. But it's the first time I've ever had, you know, a 15 minute emergency. Oh. Moly, did I pray to every God that ever, <laughs> ever, anybody ever met? I prayed to them all because, you know, what was really hit me is that um, I still have to jump out of this airplane, something could happen. So I said to my crew, you know, if something happens to me, please tell Colleen and Eric and Tara I love them. And that sobers you up and makes you go, ooh, this is still the real deal. Um, but after, you, after I said that, and after I said, prayed to every God there was, I was very clear. And it didn't, you know, the bailout wasn't like you'd see in the movies. It didn't work that well for me. I, <laughs> I had neglected to get rid of my left shoulder harness when I, had, I got rid of the canopy. On the second try, the first try, it was the airplane was so well fitted, even with the canopy release mechanism, it stayed on. And so then, and you're supposed to duck when you do that. So I ducked, didn't go, so I said, ooh. So I pushed it, my head went up, the canopy hit me right in the head, put a dent in my helmet that big. So I should have known there was a clue that it's not gonna be a script that I, I wrote. And so when I left the airplane, I tumbled out because I couldn't bail out like Superman as a shoulder harness, and I tumbled out and went right into the tail brace wires, and I'm in it. But it's amazing how clear you think when you're prepared, spiritually and technically when you're prepared. I'm riding this airplane down, and it was a, my airplane's flying wires start singing at 180 miles an hour, and I can hear them sing. And I don't feel those pressures at all because the way the airplane's turned, high and low pressure right next to the fuselage, 
But as soon as I unwedged myself, I pushed that airplane like you're pushing a log on a river. And it just went one way, and I went straight up. It fell because I'm starting to slow down to 120. Looked down, saw her going back to the left, and that's where I knew she always, this airplane always went to the left. Opened my parachute, opened my parachute, and landed, and then had to pick up the pieces and get it out of that farmer's field! <laughs> and get the heck out of Cachado, Louisiana! And they were wonderful people, but that's not where I wanted to be. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, we at our airport we have two stunt pilots, Carl Leopold and Vicky Benzie. You know either of them? I know Vicky very well, and and I flew. I just actually I've known her for years, and she's. A, I'm very impressed with her technical flying skills. And what I'm really imp impressed with is how reverent she is to the opportunity. She's a wonderful, wonderful person. Is I've never flown with Carl. I've never seen him perform, so I, but Vicki, you could be very proud that she's, she's out of your airport. She represents aviation very, very well, and she's good. She, she told us, though, that it, it actually, her, her uh, hobby actually, not hobby, but her passion, it actually costs her money. She doesn't make a lot of money. It's doing. tough. It's, it, that's the hardest thing. When I got into the business, she could actually break even almost. And now, you know, this airplane I, I have now cost me $450,000, $500,000 to build. Um, gas is eight bucks a gallon. Insurance is this. When I got in, my first aerobatic airplane was 23000 And the, the, the fees that you make as a performer aren't enough to cover it. And so a long time ago, I, I had no choice. I was a crop dumpster helicopter pilot supporting my family. I had my own business. And if I was going to do this, I knew to be successful, I needed to have sponsorship. And I've been sponsored for the last 24 years. And that comes with a, a lot of terms and a lot of condition. Vicki gets to go have fun. This is her passion. But she doesn't have to. I have a staff of, what, 13 people that it takes to run this a successful sponsorship operation. It's just like an IndyCar in terms of your mechanics, your hospitality, your logistics imitations to be successful. I've been very fortunate that I've I just finished my 13th season with Oracle. It's a year-to-year -year deal. I got all this money I throw out ahead of schedule, close to three quarters of a million dollars to get stuff done to high, keep before we even do our first show. I mean, there's, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a tough, tough business. And but when I tell people cream rises to the top, people say, oh, I'm not good. I said, it's, if it's supposed to be meant to be for you, it will. But Vicki, fortunately, can afford to do this. There's a lot of great kids that aren't getting that opportunity because the entry, the fee to get in, is pretty high now. But I, you know, that being said, I was a fool when I was 25. I crashed when I was 26, and I lost my dream until I was 34, and um, I had to build it back up and get back into it and. So I, you know, in my late 30s did I start being able to do this. I mean, this is, you know, it takes a lifetime to become an overnight success. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, it's a pleasure. I'm glad I'm here. Thank you. I love goodies. <laughs> <laughs> well, we want to thank you for coming and just a little show of appreciation. Thank you, Mike. That's very kind of you. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm wearing all this. Oh, that's cool. Blue is my favorite color, except the color of red. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you very much. How about some young eagle? This could be my young eagle hat for a kid to wear. Sure. How's that? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. I'm going to put this right here. Uh, if anyone would like to, Sean will uh, take some pictures with you. We, I'd like to get a picture with the Young Eagle pilots that are here with him uh, and some of the volunteers that have worked uh, during the year for the chapter.